Hey there, my name is Mark McCartney and welcome to the What is a Good Life podcast. For those of you that followed the newsletter last year for which I interviewed 120 people around the question of what is a good life, the objective remains very much the same. I'm trying to provide you with tools and content that help you provide your own answer to this question. This is just the third episode of the What is a Good Life podcast and on today's episode we have Tom Goodwin. Tom is the author of a book called Digital Darwinism, a keynote speaker, an advisor to Fortune 500 companies and startups, and a commentator on the future of advertising, marketing, technology, and business. He also contributes to such publications as The Guardian, TechCrunch, Forbes, and the World Economic Forum, amongst many others. In this episode, we talk about the oddity of knowing what's good for us, even enjoying it, and yet not making it daily habit. We question where do we spend all this time that we seem to be saving through all these various apps. We explore what Tom is both optimistic and pessimistic about in our use of technology. And Tom questions the obsession we have with streamlining and optimizing human behavior. And finally, he reflects on the importance of challenging his own perspectives and not taking life so seriously. The point of this podcast in general is not to provide you with top five actionable takeaways. If life were simply about absorbing intellectual information, we'd all be walking around with six packs if that was your thing and living the most productive lives. It's to bring more of the curiosities of our behavior into focus and then over time, hopefully making manageable and maintainable change. In this episode, Tom shares numerous insights, which provided me with plenty of more food for thought, and I'm sure it will do the same for you too. Without further ado, the third episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. Uh, also, you saw that I put this up on my wildly successful YouTube channel since I've emailed you. <laughs> Subscribers have doubled. We're up to 12 now. Thing, uh, things are going viral. out of control. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've... Tom, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I'm very grateful to have you here. Uh, the first question I have for you, Tom, is, is there a question that you're trying to answer as you move through life? I think um, in a non-direct way there is, um, which is kind of, you know, what am I about? Um, what actually genuinely makes me happy? Um, I think in a weird way it's the question that we never really ask ourselves. Um, we, we go through life with the assumptions of what is happiness and what success is um, and what are the sort of KPIs to guide our decisions through. And then I think slowly you go through a period of time and you realize you've kind of been on autopilot um, and you haven't necessarily asked questions. You know, I think as you get older, you might ask things like, what's my legacy going to be? Um, but I think for the moment, I, I try to discover what I'm about and what makes me me and what makes me happy and what makes other people around me happy. Um, so it's a sort of, you know, life seems to be a process of discovery about the ways in which you made assumptions that turn out to be wrong. And what are you finding out as you move through life? What are you finding out that uh, that Tom is about? <laughs> um, I'm finding out that the more I know, the more I don't know. Um, yeah. I'm finding out uh, there's a sort of extraordinary thing to me, I think, which is um, I occasionally will go through quite a big change in my life. You know, like I'll move from one country to another um, or I'll I don't know, just sort of be based in a different city for a while. And I realized that most of the things that I really, really like doing um, are things that are free, um, are things that are fairly accessible, um, and are things that I don't get addicted to doing. You know, there's a sort of weird yeah, yeah. part of human evolution where actually, you know, most people, if they eat healthy food, you know, if it's good healthy food, if you were to sort of interview them halfway through and say, you know, how's this meal? People would be pretty happy about it. They'd be like, oh yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of beautiful salad and some lovely sort of potatoes, um, some sort of, you know, lovely ham. Um, and if you were to ask the same question halfway through a sort of Big Mac meal, you know, people would be thinking, actually, this isn't that nice. You know, I kind of wish I hadn't done this. Um, and similarly, I quite often find myself in situations I might be swimming outside um, in the sunshine in Miami where I live and I'll be thinking, this is amazing. You know, I should wake up every day quite early and do this because this is one of the best feelings I've had for quite a long time. And yet we don't tend to get addicted to those things. We don't tend to sort of go through a process of ensuring that we, um, you know, plan our lives around these moments of great happiness. And that's in particular one of these weird revolutions to me, revelations, sorry, um, where you suddenly think, you know, why are we predisposed to do things that are not necessarily that good for us? You know, why do we sort of um, try and have sugary and fatty food, um, even though, you know, evolutionary wise, we don't really need that anymore. Um, so it's a very sort of curious um, sort of discovery I've made. So it was almost as kind of uh, more leaning towards um, 
I don't want to call them like sim- like simple things or mundane things, but an awareness maybe that it wasn't the the big flashy things or the the shiny things that you were at one point pursuing. Yeah, I mean, I've been quite good at never really being that bothered by things that other people may pursue. Um, right. I've never been that bothered about what other people think of me. Um, you know, it, it's interesting living in Miami because you're around lots of different people from very different places. Um, and in particular, many people have moved here um, because they're chasing signs of success. And it's quite a status uh, driven um, place because of the sort of mixture of people here. Um, and I realized that being English and coming from a small village and having a background which was very, very sort of middle, middle class, um, where you never really had to kind of worry that you would have no money, but you also thought that um, you would probably not go through processes where you'd earn tons. You suddenly realize that a lot of the things that other people are chasing are just things that would never really um, things that would never really occur to me. You know, this idea of boasting about what school you went to. Um, I would never yeah. really sort of factor into my life. This idea that you might um, have an extremely expensive car to impress people. Um, I kind of realized that a lot of those um, assumed an outward and sort of broadcasted sense of success uh, that, you know, it's, it's like I'm sort of missing part of my DNA um, that kind of needs to reflect that. I I lived in uh, Vancouver once and I'm from Dublin, so I, I, I experienced something very similar in, in terms of maybe even a difference in culture. Um, this sense of then of, um, you know, just if you were to interview or if you were to ask someone in, in halfway through a healthy meal, they'd probably be pretty content. And then this idea of someone eating the Big Mac and how do you kind of see that showing up in your own life and your own kind of relationship with some of these things? Um, it means I'm always surprised at how hard it is for me to do the things that I really like. Um, so if you were to go through quite a simple exercise of, and you know, this is not uh, rocket science, but I think it's something that people don't do. Um, if you were to say, write down, you know, fill in a whole A4 sheet of paper with things that you really like doing, um, and you know, do so without a judgment, assume that no one else is going to see that list. Um, and then fill in an A4 sheet of paper of things that you really don't like doing. Um, if you were to sort of compare that with how you spend your time, I think you'd be quite surprised at how many things you do that you don't like. Uh, you'd be quite surprised at how many things you do like doing that you don't do. And if you were to go through a logical process of looking at those things that you don't do um, and think why, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to come up with particularly good explanations um, I love playing bocce ball. It's like a sort of version of Patank that you play on the beach. Um, every day in Miami, it's quite sunny. Um, the requirements to play bocce ball are simply that there's you and a set of bocce ball uh, and sort of three or seven other people. Um, you know, it's not organizing the Olympics. Uh, and it's something I really like doing, um, especially like doing it after a few beers, actually. Um, and I bought a bocce ball set and I, I've, I've never played it ever since the day that I bought it from Amazon. You know, $95, they glow in the dark. Um, haven't done it. Uh, and I can't explain to anyone why that is, you know. Um, and it, it's a sort of process where you realize quite how strange we are. You know, we might end up, um, I think phones have quite a lot to answer for this. I think there's something quite captivating about a phone. Um, we went on a sort of family holiday uh, last summer uh, with the sort of, my, you know, my, my sisters and their kids. Um, and they were spending far too much time on TikTok. I was spending far too much time on, on Twitter. Um, so we decided at the end of every day, you know, we tell people the best thing that we learned from our respective addictions. Um, because I went into this thinking that Twitter is quite a good use of my time. It's full of lots of curious minds. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff on there that's quite inspiring. But actually, again, you know, if when someone forces you to say, you know, what have you learned today or what's the best thing that happened on this place? You know, everyone, as we went around the table, would come to the conclusion every single day that basically that was a really bad use of our time um, and that we kind of remember it being better than it really is. Um, and again, the, these things are quite strange. You know, why, why are we spending our, our time and our energy and our attention in ways that are not sort of um, additive to our lives? When you consider that uh, example there, even, even spending time on Twitter, like you're the third guest in a row now who's reflected on the <laughs> idea that they they know their 
they know their processes, they know their habits, uh, they know what's good for them. And yes, uh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, how do you, like when you kind of reflect on that, what do you, what do you see as the, the thing that Twitter is uh, affording you in that, in that moment in time? Um, I think that I am predisposed to see the parts of Twitter um, that are helpful more brightly than the parts that are unhelpful. Um, my sense is it gives me a slight feeling of connection to people, um, a very yeah. modern sort of digital form of connection. Um, my sense is that um, I get to see different vantage points from the world. I'm quite unusual with how I use Twitter. I, I deliberately seek out people that have very different opinions to me. Um, and I kind of enjoy the mind gym of trying to uh, understand where different people are coming from. Um, I enjoy the sort of lighthearted moments that it can bring. Um, I feel like at some points in time, it can be quite helpful to my career to be known there. Um, but probably more than anything else, I enjoy conversations that you can start on it. You know, I enjoy putting out ideas or thoughts into the world um, and then seeing what you learn from other people as a response to that. Um, so it may be anything from a question about a subject all the way through to an opinion that you're not sure about. Um, I think I, I really enjoy the learning process that can happen on them. How would you uh, how would you kind of view the balance in your life between the you know the the technological connections that you have in your life and then the the real world experiences of you know people being around you? Um, I am absolutely massively over indexing on sort of digital connections, um, whatever that means. Um, I think something very weird has happened where. In a way, what sites like Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram give you, um, and I'm not quite saying the same sort of cliched stuff that we've heard before, but it, it's a very, it's a very sort of condensed, um, sort of optimized, direct um, way to provide stimulus to the brain. Um, you know, by by Twitter is probably the ultimate example because the tweets are so short. You know, but you can kind of feel that you're in this feed, and if you follow the right people, you're kind of being hit with quite powerful insights or quite powerful provocations, um, or very kind of intense moments of of um, intrigue. Um, it's sort of like the ultimate highlight reel, but uh, ideas and thoughts on a good day. I mean, again, this is sort of pre pre presupposing it's it's been used in the right way. Um, and then what I found is I'd gone from that to the real world. Um, and you realize that normal people, you know, they do small talk and normal people are late. Um, normal people take a while to, to meet. Um, normal people, um, you know, say things that are not necessarily um, life-changingly profound. Um, and I kind of say this in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way, but I, I've realized almost that my, my sort of brain chemistry has been changed in such a way that when you meet people in real life, it's amazing and it's lovely um, and it's wonderful. Um, but sometimes it just sort of feels like it's quite light in a way, you know, and I, and I say this being sort of critical of myself rather than the people I'm meeting, you know, you're almost there and you kind of think, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, say something better. Um, you know, you, you're aware that if, if you want to sort of leave a situation, you can't just sort of close down the, the browser tab. Um, and I'm sort of deliberately saying this in an obnoxious way to sort of make it more funny sounding. But um, yeah, you, you kind of become so used to this sort of direct injection of energy and tumultuousness and fascination um, and humor that you go out into the real world and it all feels um, like very sort of um, non-optimized and very um, watered down. Um, and that's a terrible yeah. state of affairs. Um, but I'm being sort of honest about how it feels at the moment. Well, that's, uh, I've never heard that observation before in terms of, uh, of just the, <laughs> not how drab almost daily conversation <laughs> or interaction seem in comparison to, in comparison to the online conversations, but it's, what would you, if you could then, what would you wish to kind of imbue daily conversations with in order to increase their, their quality? I mean, I think mainly it's on me to stop being a complete jerk um, and just enjoy 
um, you know, enjoy waiting for people, enjoy looking at the way that the lighting is designed, enjoy um, looking at the plants in the corner of the room, enjoy um, the the feeling of of other people's presence. You know, in a way, it's it's sort of on me to um, change my field of vision almost to be sort of more receptive. You know, stop being a sort of directional microphone and be a sort of boom microphone where you're taking in everything um, and find enjoyment and wonder in the sort of banal. Um, I think that's the main thing. Um, I, I do think that um, there could be a move towards better conversations. Um, it, it's quite hard to say this without sounding like a complete knob, you know, because the sort of the the presupposition is I'm almost saying people are boring and they need to sort of say more interesting things and you know people are not there to be entertainment for us but I do think um especially in a business context um you know because a lot of the stuff I do in the real world is a conference um and you go around these rooms and you see you know so many conversations when did you fly in you know or did you fly direct oh you know American <laughs> Airlines you know oof. You know, I can't believe they took out the backseat entertainment. And you're kind of there thinking, you know, obviously we need to do a bit of small talk in life because that's how we sort of warm ourselves up. Um, but at some point, it'd be nice to sort of upgrade people, you know, not to big talk. Like I'm not expecting people to get into a Sheraton in Memphis and say, you know, so what's life all about? But I think medium sized talk, you know, I think um, who are you looking forward to listening to? Um, who do you think um, we're going to be surprised by what they say? You know, what what sort of bigger conversations can we take away from today? Um, you know, what's it like to be in Memphis when you've been in the, you know, California for the last three months? I think we can try and sort of upgrade our small talk to medium talk. I think. Yeah, I, I think that's nicely put, and I do I do think though that there is a, a sense of even if it's just being. Um, being a little bit like sometimes I'm so confused that some of the things that we still don't know the answers to, I didn't, I'm not going to say that we're going to start, start asking each other, what does dark energy or dark matter mean? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, there's so much that we don't know and that never even, we never even get close to, to talking about that, but yet we will talk about what's on like, or what character in a TV show, what they've done on the last episode or how that surprised us. So I, I yeah. do agree with you, this kind of, this need for like maybe a slight, a slight leveling up of, of what we're talking, whether that's even being a little bit more genuine or yes. a little bit more curious, I'd say. I think a lot of it is about, um, we've become very good at being uh, comfortable and we've become terrible at being uncomfortable. And I think in so many situations, what people are really trying to do is they're talking to sort of build a sense of camaraderie and togetherness um, and to, uh, you know, reassert um, commonalities. You know, so most of the questions are really aimed at, you know, let's prove to each other that we're quite like each other. Um, and therefore, that, that's great for a sense of um, tribe forming and relationships, but it's terrible when it comes to being inspired or learning. Um, and I think, you know, like like you say, Mark, there's a lot of sort of, false authenticity about it as well or actually people are saying things they don't believe in just to make life easier um they're saying things that they don't really enjoy talking about because that makes life easier i think maybe we need to kind of reorient ourselves a little bit um and be better at knowing moments when we can have conversations um that are more likely to sort of inspire us more likely to um allow us to learn from each other um i think um you know m maybe i'm wrong here but i have a slight sense that in the modern era not that many people have passions actually um i i i used to sort of ask people what their passions were outside of work and then i realized that that was actually really annoying to everybody um because everyone <laughs> came to the realization you know that they did you know they they had a job and they they liked it and they worked hard and they had a husband and kids or a wife or a partner and no kids or dogs or whatever you know, and outside of sort of maintaining um, their lives and their jobs, they didn't have any time for any passions. Um, and I, I don't know if this is a sort of modern thing. You know, I kind of feel like in the past, you know, my dad went through like a stamp collecting phase, which is obviously a sort of <laughs> fairly, quite, maybe quite a boring thing to do. Um, but it was still a passion. Um, you know, I remember being a kid, you know, I'd sort of collect fossils for some time. Um, and I think quite often these days, I wonder if people... 
um, it would be wise to sort of have a few more outside interests. Um, again, I'm sounding very judgy when I say this stuff, but it's just, um, it's an interesting thought. No, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Like, I think it is an, an interesting thing. Um, a friend of mine used to ask people when he asked them, what do you do? Um, but you can't tell me what your job is. Mm. And just as a, as a means of, of just trying to get people or to find out something, uh, something else about the person that they're talking to beyond the fact that they're a management consultant, uh, even a singer, an accountant, whatever it is, like what, a, what is it you do in life? And, and I think there is a kind of, I don't know, there's a, there's a sense where I think you're right. There's going back to what you said too, around this idea of authenticity, we've become very good at also knowing what the right thing is to say. Mm -hmm. um where it's not so much about what we actually believe we're just saying the thing that we think is correct and so i think yes. when you kind of have this combination of uh maybe a lack of maybe authentic interests or then even authentic values or even the courage to say what i actually think and um, it does kind of influence the or they seem like influencing kind of ingredients in terms of what you're describing and even in terms of the conversation as well yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, I know people have just got quite used to these things. You know, I think um, often I feel a bit like in life, lots of people are reading off a script um, and they're reading off the script of what they feel like they're supposed to say. Um, and that would be, um, that, that makes sense. But I think you get to the point where you almost um, spontaneously want to sort of throw the scripts up in the air and just say, look, let's have a real chat. Um, and a lot of my... I know, like I reason about my time, I'm thinking, how do I create moments where that's more likely to happen? Or how can I be supportive of people wanting to do that? Um, because a lot of people, when you try to go off script, you know, they feel quite uncomfortable about it, I think, in, in, for a variety of reasons. So, And um, what's your relationship been like with going off script in life? Was that, is that something that's innate in you? Or is that something you're developing as you're figuring out more of, of, of who you are and what you're about? Um, I'm, I'm not that sure, to be honest. I think um, I have a level of confidence and um, impatience um, and deep curiosity, which means I'm quite driven to do that. Um, I think sometimes we're quite serious about life and we kind of feel that, um, you know, by, by taking risks, um, we're living a risky life. Um, you know, asking someone a slightly too personal question is not taking a risk in the same way that um, trying to climb um, K2 is. I think, I think sometimes we've lost a sense of proportion about what risks really are. Um, and I think in a way, probably moments when you feel most yourself and most alive, um, they normally happen slightly outside of our comfort zone. Um, they probably all do um almost, almost everything that scares us is is probably worth doing um almost everything that doesn't scare us may not be um so i think i've i've just sort of learned to really enjoy being slightly uncomfortable or or very uncomfortable um i'm not sure if it's my sort of goal in life i'm not sure if it's you know something that feels like my um calling but it's just something that kind of adds to the situation um, I think probably, you know, most people listening to this, they've all been to a kind of dinner party and they've, um, on the way home, either to themselves or to someone they're with, they thought, um, you know, that, that never really took off. Then I, I didn't really get as much out of that as I thought I would do. Um, I actually think it's a much more common thing these days than it was three or four years ago. I think maybe the pandemic um, sort of removed some people's social muscles and they sort of atrophied a bit. Um, but in a way, I kind of, you know, I feel drawn to trying to do my best and for the right reasons um, to ensure that um, things like that don't happen that much. And if you were to think even more recently, uh, what was a kind of a seminal moment or, or fear or, or discomfort that you've encountered? <laughs> Um, I don't think I've been doing that, this. That you feel free to share, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it, make, it makes me realize um, I haven't been doing this as much as I normally would do. I think um, I, uh, I've spent this the last sort of two or three months traveling quite a lot. So I haven't really been um, in as many of these situations as I normally would be. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I almost always do this. I mean, a conversation I was having with a good friend about two nights ago, 
um, I was deliberately sort of pushing the conversation slightly further than um, I normally would have done because I was trying to sort of help them get to a bit of a breakthrough in how they saw a problem. Um, so, yeah, I, I like to think that this almost becomes a habit to the point where you don't really notice it. Um, and perhaps when there's a situation where you can choose one of two options, one is to go the safer route and one is to go the slightly more risky route. I think I'm probably always taking the slightly more risky route. And then obviously when it's not working out, you then sort of retreat back, you know, as quickly and as um, helpfully as possible. And when you think of, uh, when you thought said earlier at the start, you're finding out ways of uh, paying more attention to the things that bring you happiness in life. Um, what what's some what are the things that have come to mind, and and also what like what has kind of evolved or changed as you've gone through life that has almost surprised you that it brings you happiness at this point? Um, I think I'm going to give answers which are not particularly um, extraordinary here. Um, I, I realize I really enjoy physical exercise. Um, I'm not remotely competitive, um, but I I really like playing tennis. Um, I, I really like doing anything that involves being outside and walking around. Um, I really like playing golf. Um, I really like everything about moving and getting my heart rate up um, makes me feel fantastic. Um, I really enjoy meeting people um, who I find um, sort of help me understand the world in a different way. Um, I really enjoy meeting people who I find interesting. Um, meeting people who, when I talk to them, I kind of feel like I'm challenging myself. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, meeting a New York Times bestselling writer necessarily. Um, you know, some of the taxi drivers in Uber, you know, I've learned more and been more inspired by them um, in a 10 minute conversation than I have, you know, months of, of other sort of um, thoughts and ramblings. Um, no, so I, I really enjoy that. Um, I realized um, that actually, um, it was more important for me to sort of be around people that I learned from than people that I liked that much, um, which was quite a strange thing that I've learned recently. You know, I kind of, um, I've got a birthday coming up um, soon and I realized that I'd rather have people who, um, you know, I, I don't mind people that I don't really like who I find sort of quite interesting. Um, and there are lots of people there that if they couldn't come, you know, it would be fine as well. Um, so I've realized that actually, you know, maybe, maybe I'm sort of, um, in a strange mental space or maybe I see the world quite logically and I'm a sociopath or something. Um, but I realized the most interesting, the, the sort of best thing for me almost was to be around people that sort of added, um, viewpoints and insights and ways of thinking to my life, um, rather than necessarily being people more traditionally thought of as friends. But that seems to be something, and I see it in your writing too on LinkedIn, where there seems to be a genuine, you know, we were talking about earlier, people just know the right thing to say at times where they may say, I, lo I like my views being challenged. But if you look at the kind of general cultural discourse or communication, you're like, oh, we're getting triggered as hell right now. So that's probably not the case. And you've touched on it a few times. You genuinely like your point of view being challenged or your the idea of learning from people that may be not so like you. Has that, has that continuously been the case in life? Um, I, I'm not sure. It's definitely something that's been quite consistent with me for quite a long time. Um, it's, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to be sort of too dramatic. It's not like I want every conversation to be an argument. Or that no, no, I really understood. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it's not like I really sort of enjoy like massive debates with people about everything. Um. And maybe it's something that I'm doing more now that I see the world shy away from doing this. Um, I find it quite extraordinary um, how in a lot of the world, people have become completely intolerant um, of people who have even slightly different opinions to them or opinions which are the same on almost everything, but not everything. Um, I spoke to a friend the other day they said something interesting, which is, oh, you know, I like hanging around you, Tom, because you're the only person I ever meet with um, that I know that I don't know what their opinions are going to be on something before I ask them. Right, right. right. Um, and I thought that was quite an interesting thing because um, that seems quite strange to me. You know, the, the world has almost become um, a sort of restaurant with two set menus 
um, with sort of 25 courses and you can either choose set menu A or set menu B. And even this idea that you might really like set menu A, you know, but for the main, you know, you'd quite like to have uh, tuna and not, um, you know, beef. And in sort of modern discourse, this idea that you might sort of want something else that's not on your prescribed list of opinions um, is almost sort of unspeakable. Um, so I think I've just sort of, um, you know, I've realized that all progress really happens from debate, that um, what's right is normally a, a kind of process rather than a fixed thing in time. Um, and I've learned that the muscles of how to think and the muscles of kind of empathy in particular um, are really, really strong muscles to grow. And I really like growing those muscles. Um, I think they're quite helpful for my job, but that's not what it's about. It, it just seems important to be like a good human being that tries to understand the world. Um, and I'm quite dismayed by how many people um, don't want to do that. They would, they would rather feel that they're right and they'd rather feel that the world is simple and they'd rather think that people that voted for that person are idiots and that people who think this are racist and that people who um, want that policy are idiotic. Um, <clears throat> that just seems remarkably... Um, Know, lazy, boring. Um, it, it's sort of stripping out the richness of life. You know, the richness of life is, is speaking to someone who votes for someone against their self interest and wondering why. Um, the richness of life is the nuance. The richness of life is is the is is how you change over time. So. Yeah, I think it's like leaning into the complexity of life and almost looking into the abyss sometimes and kind of going, "Oh wow, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what exists there." Absolutely. That's, that's interesting. But I think yeah, that's interesting and amazing. We're, yeah. Yeah, we're we're stripping out the complexity of life and kind of wondering why we don't feel alive. Exactly. I think um there's a very interesting um sort of slow shift I think that's happened in the last maybe 10 years um where lots of sort of venture capital companies um have invested in tech companies. Um, who are making um, apps and services on the basis that, you know, eff effectively life should be more efficient. Like a lot of these companies are really about outsourcing um, your parents to an app. You know, how can someone help me um, have pizza if I can't be bothered to, to, to cook? How can someone clean up after me, you know, without me getting off the sofa? Um, how can someone sort of help me get laid? Um, and a lot of the uh, these movements, um, seem to be sort of oriented around the, 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 the idea that leaving the house is inefficient um, and that um, finding a, a restaurant that you might love is inefficient and that finding a friend, you know, takes too long. Um, and it's a bit like these people think that the ultimate form of life would be sort of living in a cocoon um, and having sort of tablets that kept your... Um, body in perfect condition like a lot of these people are also using devices to measure their sleep accurately and they're sort of obsessed with the measurement of, of their body um and this whole movement seems to have sort of forgotten that you know life is going to the local shop um and i'm not remotely extroverted like i'm, I'm a terrible at small talk i don't really like it when people sort of talk to me but it's still going to the shop and having a look around and the, the person says hello you know, and there's a person with a pram that's in your way and you sort of laugh because, you know, you nearly sort of fell into a pram by mistake. Um, you know, that's life. Like life, life is sort of yeah, taking yeah. out the trash and sort of saying, oh, look, you know, there's a plant growing up the gutter. Um, life is being in a traffic jam and looking around and sort of seeing what's going on. Um, life is being at the airport and your flight being delayed and, you know, just enjoying the extra time that you have while, um, you know, you're sort of waiting to board and looking around the faces. Um, I know somehow there seems to be this movement where, you know, life has to be in the middle of a channel and you don't touch the sides. Um, and I actually think that life is what happens when you touch the sides. You know, life is the, the, the fight you normally get into in a pub, it, that you nearly get into in a pub. Um, that happened because of an accident or a misunderstanding. Like that's not life. That's not the worst day that's ever happened. Um, that's life. Um, and I think <laughs> there's this sort of really bizarre movement towards life optimization, where people are trying to be as healthy um, and as safe um, and as unlikely as possible to catch a disease 
um, and to you know improve their the age of their heart um, so that they can live a really long life. And I kind of keep on thinking these are the, some of the most boring lives that I've ever lead. You know, like in a way, we almost need to have a, a, a movement to the opposite, which is to have as rich a life as we can have and have it full of awkwardness and misunderstanding and um, arguments and wonder. And I know everything that it is to be alive is often um, stuff that we um, seek to remove. And I think that's completely the wrong way to think about it. Yeah, I, I've i been actually, I was actually writing something about that over the weekend. I, I didn't fully finish it, but I was kind of commenting on like, uh, I saw a lady not ask the barista what song is playing. She took out her, her phone and checked on Shazam. Uh, you know, you, you don't ask a local what a good restaurant to go to is. You check TripAdvisor. Yeah. Uh, you don't ask someone for directions. You look at Google Maps. Yeah. All of these inventions, wonderful. And they've saved me a hell of a lot of time at different times, but I don't think we realize just how much kind of human connection we're stripping out of life as almost as if human connection is like an inconvenience or as you say, it kind of gets in the way of our efficiency. Yes. It's bizarre. I mean, that, that is life. And I mean, the tools are amazing. Um, And I'm not suggesting that people leave their phones at home because apart from else, it's impossible to do anything. But I think, um, I don't know, the other day I was, I was a bit lost and I was trying to find like a barber shop um, and I realized I was just looking at my phone to see where it was. And actually, if I just looked up, um, you can see where it is. And I think um, <laughs> in, a mo- in a way, you know, it's not a sort of remarkably profound moment in life. But in a way, you think it's kind of weird because we're defaulting to the screens rather than real life. You know, I think the, the job of the phone is to get you close enough to then look up and try and find it. Um, and to enjoy the fact that the entrance might be around the back and to go around the back and sort of realize that it's quite, you know, weird and, you know, the architecture of the whole um, mall is strange. Uh, and it's to sort of, in, you know, in, enjoy the the weird, in, enjoy sort of every experience that life throws us. Absolutely. And I've moved uh, country a number of times and, and I live in Berlin now. And one of the things I loved doing at the start was literally like I had when I had time, like getting lost in Berlin. like. Mm not checking my phone and trying to find different routes home. Mm. And there's almost an excitement to that. Or like you, the next time you go around the same street, you're like, ah, I know what's around the corner now, like mm. without checking my phone, if you get me. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think there's, there's this, uh, to what end at times, because when you look at the amount of time we're spending on social media and things like this, all this efficiency, we're not necessarily channeling all that saved time into the, the most helpful things as you, as you kind of noted at the very top of the conversation. I think that's, in, precisely in something, that's precisely it. Like yeah. if we're if we're saving thirty seconds finding the barber shop, you know, and that allows us to go to the local comedy club and to try a new routine that we're working on because we have a bit more time, that's fine. But if we're just saving thirty seconds so we can sit on the toilet for another thirty seconds and morosely scroll Instagram, then we're not really helping ourselves. <laughs> no, I, I, I tend to agree there. Just in in terms of when you mentioned there, just the way some technological innovations are being used, um, you know, to get a pizza delivered quicker. Um, You know, Gorillas is huge in in Berlin here and the supermarket delivery service that you can get your groceries in 10 minutes. And again, the question to what end and if it doesn't get me off the couch and we've got problems with weight loss and obesity and things like this, how helpful are these things? What are some of the most... uh, What are some examples of uh, technological innovation that make you kind of optimistic about the future? Um, I mean, broadly speaking, um, what we have at our disposal is amazing. Um, If someone had sort of stopped us in the street um, 20 years ago and said, you know, Tom, um, you've probably heard of the internet. Maybe you've got email at university. Um, just remember that this this sort of technology will connect every single person on the planet. Just remember that you'll be able to buy a smartphone for fifteen dollars in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, just think that all content ever made will be uploaded to a central um, vestibule for anyone to access, mostly for free. Um, just remember that you can listen to any local radio station in the world. Um, just remember that you can resell items that you don't like anymore and get a bit of money for them. Um, you just sort of looked at all of this um, canvas of opportunity and thought, wow, you know, the, the future will be amazing. Um, you know, people won't be ignorant. 
Um, I imagine uh, people will be better read than ever before. I imagine we'll have all of these amazing debates because we will be more informed. And then we will also have more appreciation for the fact that people see the world differently. Um, I imagine this will be a sort of democratic tool that allows corruption to be reduced. It will mean that industries become less nepotistic. It means that opportunities become more fair. Um, and I think in a way, we can look at where we are and we can feel two things. One, we can be amazed that the good things that have happened have happened um, because there are extraordinary things. It could be Wikipedia. Um, you know, it could be how remote work is allowing people who um, live in very different countries to have amazing jobs. Uh, it could be how people can now um, self-teach um, at any stage in their life and they can have continuous learning forever. Um, and I'm certainly aware that what we have done is amazing, but I think it's also a little disappointing um, with how we've used it in other areas. Um, in particular, I think the sort of anger, the level of distrust, uh, the level of, of uh, sort of extreme viewpoints on every issue, you know, whether it's something like gas stoves, um, whether it's something like EVs, like somehow we've managed to turn everything into a kind of partisan issue. And I think that's disappointing. Um, but I do think that it's kind of inevitable. Um, you know, part of my role is to understand uh, the history of technology and its adoption. And I think it's inevitable that it's fairly close towards its um, deployment. And we still are. Um, we don't really know what to do with it. And we make mistakes and monetization tends to um, sort of make marketplaces which are not perfect for the human condition. Um, and then normally it takes a sort of another wave for people to sort of digest its meaning a bit more um, and to be more thoughtful about what they make. Um, so broadly speaking, every single form of technology and how it's all used, um, I think, gives us a lever um, to make almost everything in life better. Um, but the kind of question really becomes um, how we use it and making sure that we do that. Um, in a way, um, it's a very sort of timely thing to talk about, but artificial intelligence being used to write is a very good um, sort of example and metaphor um, because either it means that um, people with brilliant minds can make it, uh, you can write better pieces um, with more information and by sort of outsourcing some of the boring bits they're not good at, you know, either it allows great writers to write even better um, or it allows people who are sort of earlier on in their life to experiment and get more uh, inspired by what can be done with writing and thinking. Um, or it means that we use it to write far, far more with less thought. It means that we start putting out stuff that's kind of factually wrong or overly simplistic. Um, and it means that the whole sort of world of content gets dumbed down. And I think these things become good examples of the power of technology for good and for bad um, and the importance of making sure that we use this stuff in a way which is, um, you know, for, for in order to help human progress, you know, putting out much more content about the importance of vacuum cleaners. Um, if you're a vacuum cleaner maker, it's, it's probably not that helpful to the world, um, but allowing kids in... Um, you know, Asian families or allowing kids in rural areas of um, Somalia to, you know, suddenly learn languages in much more rich and personal ways, um, allowing them to access um, entire new sort of corpuses of data that otherwise were quite difficult for them to access, um, sort of empowering them to be better. You know, there, there are many wonderful ways that this stuff can be used. It's kind of amazing that, like... Uh... Not to say it's the same thing as the person eating the Big Mac or the healthy meal. At the core of this is still humans and how we use the thing rather than, uh, you know, the technology being objectively good or bad, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, everything's kind of like a mirror or a lever. You know, anyone that says, yeah. you know, Twitter is bad or LinkedIn is bad or Facebook is bad. You know, these things are a reflection of, of who we are. Um, and what we're really saying is that we haven't figured out how to behave in these contexts yet. And I think um, my, my overriding feeling is to be very optimistic about how this technology can be used um, at the same time as being a little bit worried about how we're using it in the interim. Yeah, I think that um, 
that mirrors something I say a lot as well as like long term, I'm optimistic about humans. And like, you know, yeah. even when you kind of laid out there the, the history of technology and when you kind of said, or, you know, with the internet, even like 30 years ago, if you said this would be the scenario that would have all these things, you'd be like, wow, that sounds fucking amazing. Yeah, and they're yeah, all yeah. true. You, you yeah. know, that, that is our present reality. Um, but then, yeah, short term, like in, in terms of uh, AI and, and, and content and things like that, there are reasons to be concerned in the short term. But I think, you know, long term, I think even with humans, if you zoom out far enough, like not even humans, we've come a long way from the primordial puddle. Uh, you know, like when we're talking about needing maybe miracles uh, to change existence, well, you know, a lot of miracles, seeming mir seemingly miracles have kind of happened already. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's important to realize perhaps that we're still children in terms of using this technology, right? Like in the context of how long we've been around, if Homo sapiens have been around for 300,000 years and how long this kind of technology has been in our lives, we're still babies, right? Yeah, I mean, we're not designed for this at all. I mean, we're designed as a species to not have enough food, um, to not trust each other at all, unless people um, look like us and have been around us for a while. Um, we're not designed to be able to travel in a plane and to suddenly arrive in a different climate. Um, we're not designed to have lives that change that quickly. Um, we're not designed to live lives that are not local as well. You know, we're designed to sort of live in a tiny little gathering of people and to sort of wander around slowly. And I think we um, we don't realize how much tension these things create, that we don't realize how difficult it is for us to comprehend. We don't realize the kind of power that we're unleashing. Um, you know, there have been occasions where people have done really stupid things. I remember someone got fired because they did a kind of tweet from a plane as they were going over Africa um, and said something horrendous. Uh, and I think they were quite young. And again, you know, I, I don't think we're that good at realizing how bad we are at using this stuff yet. You know, we haven't made the rules. We've got no idea what the etiquette is. I mean, that's a slightly different conversation. But, you know, like uh, 20 years ago, if you were sick, you know, you knew what you had to do. You'd work in an office, you'd phone up your boss, you'd tell them that you were sick. Um, and they'd say, oh, don't worry, you know, get well soon. Um, now, are you, are you supposed to send them a text? Um, are you supposed to even bother telling them? Are you supposed to send them an email? Are you supposed to phone them? Um, are you supposed to hope they don't notice and get away with it? Um, <laughs> even tiny little moments like that. You know, are you supposed to tell your clients? Uh, you're supposed to have an out of office. Uh, we have no idea. Um, and I think little moments like that make you realize um, how how complex and confusing these times are for most people. How do you, in, in general, kind of handle that, either the, the complexity of or the, the ever-growing kind of complexity um, that, that a lot of these tools are bringing to our lives? Uh, I think I try and relax about it, um, try and enjoy the complexity um, in a slow, um, kind of easygoing way. I try to explore these things and try and understand them. Um, but not with pressure on myself. Um, yeah, we kind of touched upon it earlier, but just enjoying what we don't know. Um, you know, the sort of act of meandering through an area of discovery, I think, is quite good fun. Um, the act of throwing out hypotheses quite gently, gently um, and sort of learning from what happens um, is great. So I think um, I try not to take life too seriously, and I try not to take these things too seriously. Um, and I kind of enjoy playing in these spaces in a way. Um, and just realizing that, you know, broadly speaking, everyone's going through similar stuff. Um, I think um, it, it really hits me these days, actually, there's, there's, especially in America. Um, there's like a lot of anxiety in the world. You know, people are, people are genuinely terrified of losing their jobs and people are genuinely terrified about what would happen if they did. Um, and I think sometimes we need to take a bit of a step back away from all of it and realize that we actually, you know, often we enjoy situations which require us to um, rise against the odds. And often we enjoy change when we're forced to do it. Um, often we learn a lot about ourselves in these processes. Um, and, um, you know, we, sh we should strive to be less anxious and to have more fun. I think Every everything in modern life has become very serious, I think, somehow. Um, and by, by saying that, you immediately open yourself up to abuse because people can say, oh, it's easy for you to say, you know, because you're sort of white and privileged and, and tall and blonde and, you know, you, d you don't know what it's like to be me. 
and I think we can look at that and either go, yep, you're right, that's a good point, um, you know, Tom has no idea, or go, you know, actually you've just sort of, in a way, you've kind of helped reinforce the fact there is a problem because if the idea that someone is saying that you should have fun in life um, is that abhorrent to you, um, then maybe <laughs> maybe you're helping um, sort of prove my point a little bit. I'm just thinking of the idea of fun causing uh, outrage of <laughs> um, I, um, and being demonized. Yeah, I used to have um, at one job in my life. I had a, an office, which was quite strange. Um, and on my door, I had a, a poster of, of sort of Kermit the Frog um, leaning forward from the handlebar saying, you know, there's no evidence whatsoever that life has to be serious. Um, and I used to love going into my office and seeing that because every day would make me realize, you know, one of the, one of the great privileges of, of working in advertising like I used to is everything you do doesn't really matter that much. I mean, uh, you're, you're not in a role where people are going to live or die based on what you do. And you can either look at that and think how sad it is that you're spending all of your time doing something so trivial. Uh, you can think of it as um, a sort of wonderful gift where there doesn't need to be that heaviness to that much heaviness to what you do. And um, I'm not a sort of superficial, sort of deeply silly, disrespectful person that goes around life sort of tickling everyone, saying smile. Um, but I do think we need a bit of a force um, just for seeing the the sort of the <laughs> seeing the sort of the strangeness of modern life, um, sort of seeing the funny side to everything, um, sort of enjoying the implausibility of it all. Um, and trying to weigh that up with, you know, the heaviness and the seriousness at the same time. But, you know, how, how can you sort of hold both cups and then decide which one to drink from? Yeah, it, it almost comes down to like holding the paradox at the same, like holding yeah. the paradox and holding both sides simultaneously, because without the, the moments of hope or joy or laughter, the rest of it is like this tsunami washing over us and how would you get up yes. each morning? Um, so I, I really think that there's, there's a lot in that. And then this kind of sense as well of holding life a little bit lightly because yes. I think the more we're trying to view things kind of in a binary way, we're just, we're really trying to control the environment or we're trying to control outcomes. But as you've yes. kind of touched on so many times in, in this conversation already, it's so important to be able to hold um, or to, to be okay with the uncertainty of the the future that's unfolding and that we Absolutely. don't always know. I mean, realistically, um, a couple of things. Almost everything that we worry about happening doesn't happen. Um, almost everything that we should have worried about, um, we didn't because we didn't see it coming. Um, and therefore, generally speaking, worrying about things is kind of a waste of time and we would be better off um, preparing for you know um, a life of adaptability more. Um, and generally speaking, um, we can't control that much of our reality. Um, and the secret is knowing what we can control and what we can't and accepting that we're much better off altering our attitude towards how we have to respond um, than we are trying to control variables that are out of our control. Um, and actually, the resilience that most people have is quite extraordinary. Um, you know, people, people sort of whip themselves up into a frenzy. You know, they think, um, I don't know how I would live um, if I don't get this promotion. You know, I don't know how I can possibly um, survive if um, I don't send my kids to private school or just sort of completely ridiculous things like that. Um, and I think in a way when people are put into slightly more difficult times you know they actually start to grow muscles which which makes them realize that a lot of their fragility really came from a sort of lack of self-belief about how they could respond to different things and when people are put in difficult situations and they overcome them um, then people are much more able to to be kind of confident about their own futures I think. I, it, it almost feels like we've we've kind of lost trust in human beings, <laughs> you, yes. you know, like, and, and I think this idea of what you said there, and even what we even touched on when I started the call, uh, before we were starting the call, um, I think sometimes stress can be a good thing. Like it can be, mm -hmm. it can, it can extract from us what we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to deliver if the stress wasn't there, if you know what I mean. Just in, in terms of, um, in terms of just you're talking about like how you hold try to hold life a little bit lightly or even talking about how 
conversations with other people, how you can learn things from different people. Even mentioned at the start of as you go through life, you're trying to figure out who you are. Um, what challenges do you face in, in trying to experience a good life? Um, I think, um, honestly, it's, um, it's, um, following through with a concerted effort to do the things that are good for me, um, and resisting the temptation to do things that somehow I know are bad for me. Um, but, uh, somehow tempting um and that could be anything from um use of social media um sort of inactivity um it could be um sort of drinking alcohol um i think uh, somehow knowing that you have kind of two buttons um at any one period of time and one of the buttons is something that will make you feel bad um and the other button is something that will make you feel good and the one that will make you feel bad and is bad for you somehow, you know, blinks in a way that mesmerizes <laughs> you. Um, I think that's the kind of challenge. You know, I, I quite often feel like in life I'm at mini sort of junctures. Um, and they're not dramatic ones. You know, it's not like a sort of film where there's a, a plane that's going to leave, you know, that you can decide to get on or not. Um, you know, it might just be, oh, should I go for a walk or should I not? And then you sort of don't. And you think, oh, actually, I don't think I've ever been on a walk that I didn't like. Um, you know, should I send the email to the person saying, let's hang out next week, you know, or should I not? And I think, um, if I'm honest, the sort of the, the basic decision to uh, choose what I know is the right thing, um, often that's a lot harder than it should be. Oh man, I, I think that's almost the great human dilemma, isn't it? <laughs> like when you're, you're saying that, I'm, I'm thinking of like five or six examples in my own personal life where I'm yeah. like, yeah, yeah it's, it's so like when, when have I ever regretted going for a walk? <laughs> like, yeah, but literally it's remarkably never. stupid though, isn't it? I mean, because you'd imagine it would be a much harder thing. You know, I'd imagine it would be yeah. that, you know, the thing that's really good for you costs you quite a lot of money and then you have to sort of weigh up the pros and cons or the thing that's really bad for you is actually really, really, really good fun. Um, and therefore, obviously, it's sort of tempting to do it. You know, but often the things that are bad for me, you know, is just waking up and going on Twitter. Um, there's this thing called the loop. I don't think many people talk about it as much as they should. But the loop is basically where people wake up and then they check, um, you know, maybe Facebook and then they sort of dabble there for a while. And then they check Twitter and they dabble there for a while. Maybe they go on Nextdoor or LinkedIn or, or Instagram or whatever. And there'll, there'll be a sort of um, a circle of, of sort of three or four or five different social media apps that people do. Um, and they might do it for 45 minutes and it's not a good use. You know, it's not something that gives them joy and they just get mesmerized by it. And um, I think in a way, quite a lot of our life is, is things like that, where you're, you're kind of thinking this is not um, in any way a good thing for me to do. And I know it's not, but somehow I can't stop myself from doing it. Um, and I think uh, learning how to take those moments and to make the right decision, I think, is quite a key thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd fully echo that. Um, Tom, just o over the course of the conversation, you know, you were mentioning at the start, uh, trying to find out who you are and what you're about as you go through life and um, the importance of challenging your own perspective and um, the enjoyment of kind of simple things and um, the enjoyment of, of kind of your curiosity and, and opening yourself up to different views. Um, you've mentioned a number of things that I'm sure will contribute to the, your answer to this question, but to kind of ask you more explicitly at the end of this uh, conversation, what is a good life for you? I think a good life is one where you feel proud of who you are, um, where you are stimulated in ways um, that are uh, helpful to your growth, um, where you have connections with people that matter. Um, and where you have a sense of sort of pride in your contribution, I guess. Um, and that, that doesn't have to be a sort of grandiose thing. You know, I think it's quite easy to listen to these things and to presuppose, you know, that means, um, you know, having a sort of building with your name on it or something. Um, no, I think, you know, I, I try to sort of look back on those days and just think, oh, you know, was this a good day? Um, you know, do, am I, am I sort of proud of, of who I was today? Um. So I think in a way it's the summation of lots of, of, of quite good little decisions 
and lots of quite good sort of humble contributions. Um, and um, I'm not remotely spiritual, um, but I do think there's an energy that people have. And I do think that that, that energy takes on a weird form um, where it feels quite physical. Uh, we've all been at parties where someone enters the room and the, the room gets louder. Uh, and no one can really know why, but but somehow there's this energy in there, and there's obviously people that have the opposite energy. Um, so without putting pressure on myself, like I, I I try to to be the person that's sort of adding to situations. Um, and I think if you put all of those things together, um, that probably means a good life. You know, there's uh, something you mentioned earlier, just when it's not like this kind of cinematic moment of jumping on a plane, um, you know, even there as well, it's like just going to bed, knowing that maybe today was a good day or I, I did well today. And even just what you've been touching on, like, you know, kind of embracing the uncertainty of life and the not knowing and doing your bit. Uh, I think you kind of broke it down in a very nice way there to just not make this some huge task that one must think about so deeply, but just kind of how, how I contribute to the world on kind of a, in a daily basis without being yes. kind of too obsessed with grandiose ideas around legacy and so forth. Um, Tom, look, that's uh, that kind of brings us up to the end of the time here. And um, look, just thank you very, very much for your time, Tom. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you, really enjoyed the in insights that you've shared. And, um, and thanks very, very much for joining me here on What is a Good Life. My pleasure. Thanks very much, Mark.